Good afternoon. Welcome to all of you for making the time during this time of holidays and all the other priorities that go with it. Um, I'm really pleased to have an eminent, distinguished group of economists in the panel today talking about a topic that is um, a bit out of the comfort zone of um, most chief economists of the World Bank, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, thank you all for coming to the session, and those of you who uh, come quite regularly to NOMAD, you don't, know, don't need any introduction, and thank you for your continued support. But uh, probably some of you are not familiar with NOMAD. It's a multidisciplinary knowledge initiative to create a menu of policy options on migration. And uh, this is the last uh, sort of big event uh, of the NOMAD brown bag launch series. And I'm really pleased to have the eminent group of um, uh, economists uh, here today in the panel. Today is International Migrants Day. And um, uh, this time, it doesn't feel like a crisis. The crisis period of last year in terms of refugees and migrants crisis seems to have, uh, have, uh, have passed. Uh, but 2017, the past few months in particular, have uh, also highlighted um, the difficulties, the challenges of migration in a very serious way. And in particular, the worry, the fear of loss of national identity and the uh, giving away of sovereignty, national sovereignty that has come up in a big way in global discussions. So while we have, we made a lot of progress last year in 2016, uh, about um, uh, forming a global compact on migration, a global compact on refugees. This year, we are uh, in the throes of Brexit, in the throes of um, uh, US last week, two weeks ago, pulling out of the global compact on migration. And we have all these electoral outcomes all over Europe and, and many other countries that don't seem particularly friendly towards uh, migration. So. Um, all of that, this pulling back, is in response to what? About a million people, maybe two million people uh, coming in as migrants into Europe and perhaps uh, US. But there is the big worry. You know, we have 250 million international migrants in the world. If you look at demographic projections, 2.1 billion people will, will join the working age population in developing countries by 2050. 2.1 billion more people will join the working age population by 2050 in developing countries. If you use current employment rates in each of the developing countries, by 2050, if that employment rate were, were to prevail, then 1.2 billion jobs would be created. That would leave out 875 million people looking for jobs. Even if you assume that the percentage of people over 70 or over 69 or something that would not be looking for jobs are about 30% of the population. That would leave about 600 million people looking for jobs and perhaps thinking about migration. The current stock of migrants internationally is 250 million. So if we were worried about 1 million or 2 million, we should be then thinking about 500 or 600 million more migrants or doubling or tripling of migration stock. And that is the tsunami that we should be preparing for. What that means is World Bank Group cannot say that we don't do migration anymore. We cannot say that we should not be addressing migration. And I'm hoping that our chief economist would share their thoughts on what sort of out of the box thinking that might be required and what of sort of bread and butter thinking that is also required in the area of migration to take the World Bank group and their particular part of the institution, let's say IFC or uh, the Africa region or the East Asia and Pacific region, how that uh, can be, uh, that viewpoint could be integrated into the migration thinking. So with that, um, I would like to welcome our panelists and um, um, you know all of them, so I'm just going to say a couple of words about each of them. We have Shanta Devarajan. He, nobody knows him. Uh, he just happens to be the senior director of uh, the uh, development 
Development Economics Vice Presidency. Um, everybody knows him. And then we have Hans Peter Lankes. He's the Chief Economist and VP for um, IFC. On my right, we have Sudhir Shetty. Again, nobody knows him. He's the Chief Economist of East Asia and Pacific. And we also have Albert Sufak on my right, extreme, extreme right, the Chief Economist for the Africa region. So I'm going to go in the order of uh, sort of alphabetical order. And uh, on my left is Shanta. So uh, the format would be that each of them, uh, I would request them to speak for about five minutes to make introductory remarks. And then we will open up for questions and answers. So Shanta, over to you. Well, thanks very much, Dilip. And thank you all for coming. This is. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to speak to a subject that's very close to my heart and something I've been uh, thinking about for a long time uh, and maybe offer some uh, insights from some recent work we've been doing in DEC. You know, I mean, if you think about it, when somebody moves from a low productivity job to a high productivity job, we celebrate, right? That's what we call structural transformation. This is what we're all trying to do is to help people move from low productivity activities to higher productivity activities and increase their earnings. But somehow when that person moves, if he happens, he or she happens to cross a boundary, a border, then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> then we start getting worried. And we start saying, oh my God, you know, what's that, what's that gonna do to the host population? What's that gonna do to the source country? What's that, uh, you know, what, what's gonna be do, what is it gonna do to, to sovereignty and culture and everything else? So keep in mind, this is something very odd because we are all committed to structural transformation. We are all trying to help these poor people improve their productivity. But somehow there's this one little quirk that if they happen to cross a border, we get, into, uh, we get into all sorts of difficulties. And the difficulty is really the fact that, and, and then people have done lots of studies, including people on this, on this panel, um, to look at what are the impacts of migrants on the uh, destination country. And really the economic results, that the evidence, is another case where it's so far removed from the political rhetoric. If you look at the economic effect, by and large, and these are, you know, this is not a random collection of studies. This is the systematic evidence across a large number of countries and a large number of studies show that the effect of migration on wages in the destination country is either zero or slightly positive. It's almost surely not, uh, not negative. It is, you know, and these are, it's not just some crazy researchers at the World Bank, but this is like the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, that uh, uh, presents it. Then the, the other thing is the effect of migration on public finances. You know, the, the rhetoric is, oh, they're draining our treasuries and living off uh, welfare. Well, no, it turns out that migrants are a net contributor to the, uh, to the treasuries in Europe. This was an OECD study. Uh, again, across the board, zero. And, and you know the reason for that is because migrants tend to be younger, so they use the health system much less. Uh, um, than, the, than the older Europeans. Uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and even the, the arguments about crime, you hear the stuff about, oh, well, you know, they're going to bring crime and terrorism and, and into, into our country. Well, migrants actually commit fewer crimes than natives. And again, there is a reason for that, because they're scared. They don't want to get in trouble. So they actually refrain from, from crime. And again, this has been documented in France and in Germany and in, in lots of places. So that's the economic evidence. So you would think, you know, if something can actually improve, first of all, it improves the migrants' lives and the effects on the destination country is either zero or favorable, as the evidence seems to point, then what is going on? Where's this, this, this rhetoric? Because the rhetoric is almost as shrill on the other side. You know, that the, the, the reason why we have unemployment in our country is, is migration. Uh, the reason why we, we, are, we have a fiscal deficit is because of migrants. The reason why we have all this crime and terrorism is migrants. And it has led to the rise of populist parties, as, as uh, Dilip was alluding to. Um, and uh, many, many parties have used migration as the clarion call to, to uh, get elected. So what can we do in this situation? I mean, we've, we have this huge disconnect between the economic benefits of migration and the political uh, rhetoric. 
And so this is some work that uh, we've been doing in DEC. Uh, Chala Osden and, and uh, colleagues uh, are about to release a policy research report where you can try to explain at least parts of this disconnect from the, uh, from the observation that migration tends to be concentrated, both in time and in space. So migrants tend to concentrate in particular regions. And, and what you find is, and this explains also why the, the wage effects are, are minimal, is that the, the, the local uh, population then moves out of the region where the migrants are coming in. So this was observed in, in, in Germany when uh, the Czech uh, Czechs, there was something in the late 80s where Czechs were allowed to move to Germany to work. And what you found exposed was that there was a very little wage uh, effect, but huge dislocations among Germans. So a lot of Germans moved out rather than having to compete with the migrants in, in the region of Germany where the migrants moved to, moved to other parts. So you got big quantity changes, but small uh, price changes, small, uh, small wage changes. And the same thing happens that migrants tend to concentrate in particular sectors and in particular skill areas. So this is a classic case. It's just like it was, it was with trade policy in the, in the old days where the, the, there are clear benefits from trade liberalization, but the losers are concentrated. And they can actually make a lot of noise uh, by the fact that they're, they're concentrated and they are the people who are most affected. But that also tells you that there's a possibility for public policy, which is use the benefits from the, the, the overall benefits from migration, the huge efficiency gains that you're going to get from migration to compensate some of the losers. And there can be programs to help these people adjust, the, the, the natives who are particularly affected to adjust. Um, and uh, exploit the, 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 uh, the efficiency gains. But let me conclude by saying that I think that's a, if you like, that's a short-term uh, solution or a short-term uh, way to address this problem in the short term. It's very necessary. But I think there's a long-term aspect to migration that we have to keep in mind, which is that there are two things. One is, as I said earlier, migration is probably the biggest the, the most important way somebody can improve their, uh, their productivity. I mean, the, the, the estimates are something like your productivity increases ninefold if an Ethiopian moves to Italy, right? Now, you take all the World Bank projects that we do in Ethiopia <laughs> and add them all up, and you don't come close to that kind of rate of return. This is the biggest development project you can even imagine. Right? So you got this huge, big ticket benefit out there. And then the other side, Europeans are getting old and the population is declining. So there's a huge need for young people to, to, to man some of the service industries in, in, in Europe. So you, can, you ha they have this huge potential long-term gain, both in terms of poor Africans moving to, uh, to, to Europe and old Europeans actually benefiting from the, the services that these people would, would benefit, right? And we are leaving that, we're leaving the, the billion dollars on the sidewalk. We're, if, instead of trying to capture those gains, we're saying, no, 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 let's not do any of that. Let's not even talk about it. And I think we may be in the wrong side of history on this one if we, if we pursue that line. I really think, and this is, this is controversial, <laughs> and I have to say I discuss it with Lance Pritchard, which doesn't reassure you anymore, <laughs> but, but, but really think, I mean, this is somewhat serious. Uh, if you think about it, we, th there's been a history of major transitions where civilization collectively has decided we are going to stop some kind of discrimination. So we, it starts with abolishing slavery, moves to giving women the vote, moves to civil rights in the United States, um, and then more recently, the move towards same-sex marriage uh, acro uh, across a, a number of countries. All of these are actually statements where society as a whole has decided that people should not be discriminated against by the circumstances of their birth. What's left? The one thing that's still left, the one discrimination that's still left is discrimination by location of your birth by the fact that you were born 
in Ethiopia is what's stopping you from moving to Italy and nine and, and, and quintupling or whatever the word is, nine times your, your productivity. So I think despite the rhetoric, despite the, the populist backlash in, in, in Europe and in the United States, I think that's going to wane when we finally decide from the point of view of equity, equity to people by virtue of their location of birth, that we have to change to one where you're no longer discriminated and we should legalize their ability to move to improve their lives, which is what we all want to achieve. Thanks. Thanks, Shanta. Thanks for um, the key message that I take away, the, the, the productivity gains from migration, one to nine sort of numbers, probably higher than the World Bank productivity, uh, and um, compensating the losers from migration by using the huge gains from migration. That's an excellent point. Um, what to you, Hans-Peter. Thank you, and, and thanks, Shanta. You can always be counted on to be both visionary and controversial. And uh, I think what I take from this is that the World Bank ought to get into the business of, of organizing the migration of Mexicans and Central Americans to the US mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and put that in opposition to the wall. And uh, that's, of course, uh, absolutely right from, a, from an economic angle. Um, uh, and uh, it's sort of the big picture, which I had hoped to get from you. I'm going to focus on something much more simple and practical so that we have both extremes here. Um, so when you look at uh, migration, the, 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 the causes of migration, economic, uh, political, and forced displacement, economic and political migration has always been seen as something that is, uh, that is permanent. And you look for permanent solutions uh, to it. Um, forced displacement has typically been approached more from a humanitarian angle. And what we're living through right now is a forced displacement crisis of, uh, of a magnitude that uh, we, we haven't seen in a, in a very long time. Um, my argument is that we need to see forced displacement uh, increasingly as a, a permanent uh, phenomenon and find permanent, find development solutions to that. Uh, it's uh, simply not um, viable that we would uh, expect large populations living in refugee camps in other countries to, uh, to either return within the near future, there is no particular prospect of doing so, uh, or of continuing to live uh, of humanitarian assistance. And if we look at uh, forced displacement as a uh, more uh, uh, permanent, lasting phenomenon, then the solutions uh, vary. Uh, and those uh, can be very controversial locally. Uh, we've seen this, for instance, in, in Lebanon, where there has been temporary displacement from Palestine since 1948, uh, and uh, Lebanon hasn't uh, really come to terms with that. And now there's another migration wave, of course, which is uh, posing the same kinds of questions. We see the same kind of resistance locally uh, uh, anywhere where you, we get uh, large, uh, uh, sudden influxes uh, of refugees. Um, and um, the conclusion from that, from a uh, perspective of an MDB and, and looking for solutions, is that we need to address the needs of the whole community, not just those of uh, the displaced persons. We have to find development solutions for the hosts and the IDPs. Um, and in searching for such solutions, we will need to involve the private sector because like in development, generally the private sector is going to be the one creating the vast majority of the jobs and of the permanent livelihoods. So we need to involve the private sector in finding permanent solutions to the displacement of large numbers of people. That is basically um, the, the one message I, I would like to get across. Um, IFC has been working with uh, private uh, companies in the refugee space, but it's been very ad hoc. There are not many examples uh, of, of that uh, in the past. Uh, we are now uh, trying to do this more systematically and to develop the tools that allow us to do this. The risks uh, tend to be uh, relatively high. Um, displaced persons are not 
registered, there's no credit history, there's a lot that makes it difficult to, to work with them, and we're all aware of that. Um, but uh, there are also tools that one can use. And um, the key areas that we see uh, in which this is possible, and where there are sort of first examples that function well, is A, in creation, in creating entrepreneurship or supporting entrepreneurship, micro or very small uh, enterprise uh, development uh, in these communities. Uh, second, an agribusiness value chains uh, around uh, uh, heavy concentrations of, of uh, uh, refugee communities. Education and health services can be provided by the private sector in these circumstances, and we see increasingly examples of that happening in Jordan. Uh, IFC has taken an equity stake in Luminous, which is a, a, uh, a TVET uh, uh, vocational uh, training uh, provider with a target of reaching 2,400 2, Syrian refugees by the end of next year that taps into the UN agencies and their uh, support, their, their uh, identification of the, of the uh, target population, uh, and also uh, in, in providing some of the funds that have to come along with uh, private uh, providers. Uh, so that is an, an important dimension, actually, the cooperation that we as IFC are not used to with the UN agencies in these circumstances, and it's very promising and fruitful. Um, and then the expansion of uh, services, of utilities in particular, in, in uh, cities such as in southern Turkey that have had a significant influx of refugees and a lot of pressure on their uh, local transport, on water and sewage and, and waste disposal. Uh, we have to find solutions for that, not, ex not assuming that the refugees will be gone within a year or so. And again, the private sector can get into this. There's a need for concessional financing in these uh, circumstances, uh, as I mentioned, and so donor partnerships are uh, very important. Now, the IFC also now has a variety of risk of de-risking instruments that uh, we intend to use. As an example, um, in Lebanon, uh, there is uh, IFC has taken uh, has, has provided support through Al Majmua, which is a uh, micro and uh, very small equity provider to uh, refugee communities uh, and uh, is, uh, has, is using a first loss feature, a risk sharing feature, uh, which is making that uh, viable. And is again using maps by UNHCR to identify in which communities to go. And those are communities in which not just the refugees, but everybody living there is going to be supported by these events. So that's the, the basic uh, message. Let's look at it as a long-term phenomenon. Let's find long-term solutions. Let's involve the private sector in that. Sudhir? So uh, thank you. Thank you, Dilip, and thanks for inviting me. You've, uh, you've heard a very eloquent uh, defense by Shanta of uh, why we should work on uh, this issue. Uh, the good news, Shanta, is we in East Asia, and I'm not taking any credit for this. This preceded me by a long time. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on migration, so uh, Dilip can rest easier uh, when he goes home every evening. He can at least, at least there's one region that isn't turning away from this issue. And as I said, it's not my doing, it, it preceded me. And, and part of that is, so, so let me just uh, talk a little bit about why that's particularly relevant, I think, in East Asia. And, and I'm gonna, uh, uh, Hans Peter has already talked about uh, forced displacement. I'm gonna come back to economic migration and, and put that in, in the context of East Asia and where it is today. But second, uh, talk briefly about the kind of work we've been doing and how I think that uh, 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 fills uh, uh, the role or, or what, what kind of role that, that suggests for the bank going forward as well. So first, uh, uh, it's, and, and I'm gonna distinguish within East Asia because I think it's worth distinguishing between two aspects. One is uh, sort of East Asia, uh, what we call East Asia which is primarily the ASEAN economies, China, Mongolia, and then second, the Pacific Islands, because I think the motivation for looking at this and for the kind of work we do is different in each of those cases. In, and, and on East Asia in particular, let me talk a bit about ASEAN. Now, it, within ASEAN, we have a very diverse 
range of countries, right? So you have Singapore and Brunei at one extreme, and then you have Myanmar, Cambodia, and Laos on the other. So you have a case where you have the richest country, Singapore, being about 25 times richer than the poorest country. So this is the kind of motivation that uh, uh, Shanta was providing. There's a huge, there, are, there, are, there have to be huge gains from people moving across these borders in addition to goods moving and services moving. Now, where this region has done very well is liberalizing, and ASEAN in particular, is liberalizing goods trade. It hasn't done so well in liberalizing services, and it hasn't done as well either in terms of uh, mobility of people. And so that's uh, so. So there are there are gains to be had there uh, from from pe people moving across these borders. The Pacific Islands are different. The Pacific Islands, for those of you that uh, are less uh, are relatively unfamiliar with it, are characterized by three things. One is distance; they're far away from anywhere. The second is dispersion, and my favorite example for that is if you take the, the uh, island country of Kiribati, Kiribati is dispersed on a scale in the Pacific that is as large as the landmass of India. However, if you were to squish it all together and it were one contiguous territory, it would be as large as New Delhi. So that gives you a sense of how, how dispersed it is. And, and then the third thing is these are very small. These are very small islands So, uh, in terms of population. So given that, labor mobility has to be, international labor mobility has to be an integral part of their uh, development strategy, of people leaving and going to, and for a bunch of them, like the Marshall Islands, like Palau, they, they already have free access to labor markets in the U.S. But there are others uh, like Kiribati, that don't have that. And yet, uh, you know, getting some of those people to New Zealand, to Australia, uh, to other locations, to Korea, would actually improve their lives and the, and the options for those islands tremendously. So, so this is the case for migration, and this is why we need to study. Now, Shanta talked about one reason for the bank to be involved, and it is essentially to sort of look for policy, first of all, to uh, to show that the net gains here are very large and positive, and second, to help these countries design measures that can that can help compensate the possible losers. Well, uh, let me suggest a third, which is I think also important, which is uh, while it's true that the net gains from this sort of migration are positive, what is also true is that there are a variety of market and policy failures in this area that suggest that good policies matter. That, so, for instance, we've just finished a piece on uh, labor mobility in the ASEAN, and one of the things it shows is that current policies are neither good for sending countries, nor for receiving countries, nor for the migrants themselves. So there are better policies that could be put in place by these countries that could benefit each of these three groups. And that is part of why you hear the pushback against migration, part of why you hear the Malaysians complain that uh, unskilled laborers from Indonesia are taking the jobs of Malays is because there are lousy policies in place. Part of it is also that they, they, they haven't been told what the, real, uh, the reality is, and part of it is that there aren't policies in place to compensate the losers, but part of it is also that there are lousy policies. So that's a role for the bank. So, that, so let me conclude then by talking a little bit about, so what, do we, what is the kind of work we do? The first kind of work is precisely to do the analytical work to bring out these numbers, to bring out the reality of uh, what the possible gains are. The second thing to do is providing technical assistance to help countries improve their policies, uh, to, to make the point that, uh, the kinds that, that right now possibly the largest gainers from inappropriate migration policies all over the world, East Asia and the Pacific not excluded, are probably the middlemen, the brokers. They are the ones reaping the rents. Uh, they are the ones benefiting from the information asymmetries between the migrants uh, and, and, the, and the potential employers, between the sending countries and the receiving countries. And the third thing to do 
is that we and 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 something that we are doing is bringing together uh, countries to learn from each other. It turns out the Philippines does a lot of things in this area actually pretty well because they depend on this much more than other countries. So there's actually things that Indonesia, that Cambodia, that Laos could learn from the Philippines. So we could be the facilitators since we work in these countries. So, so again, I want to leave you by saying that I think there's a role for us at the country level and there's a role for us at the regional level, whether it's in the Pacific or whether it's in East Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Sudhir. Albert. Uh, okay. Um, there's always a big challenge speaking last, but thankfully my name is Zufak, so it hasn't changed. I'm always used to speaking last. So a um, couple of things here. Uh, first, let me uh, start by saying uh, that from an African perspective, 2016 has been a very sad year for migration. As I was preparing for this discussion, two images kept coming to my mind. One is the auction of African migrants as slaves in Libya a couple of months ago. And the second image that kept coming up was this large number of Africans dry, drowning in uh, the Mediterranean Sea almost below the cameras, below the uh, radars. And in fact, since 2014, more than 11,000 Africans have drowned in the Mediterranean Sea, and this hasn't been a big issue in any big media. And Shanta was mentioning earlier why or how location of birth is the ultimate discrimination remaining? Well, I want to argue that that discrimination is exponential when that place of birth of yours is Africa. And in fact, I wanted to check because I was still quite, um, I, I, I've been quite bothered by how much emphasis is on African migration. So I wanted to check and try to understand the numbers. So the first thing I'm going to do is to basically set the record straight on African migration. Second, I'm going to try to talk about the impact, uh, economic impact and, and, uh, and, and uh, the drivers of, of migration for Africa. And three, I will discuss quickly what to do about it and what we're doing. On the first point on, on you know, setting the record straight, I think it's important to you know, realize that of the 250 million migrants in the world, less than 15% are of African origin. There are less than 35 million Africans out of the 250. The largest cohort of immigrants are from Asia, 43%, Europe, 62, uh, 25%, lack 15%. So Africa is actually way below in terms of number of migrants to the world. And that's something that does, it's, it doesn't always come up in you know, the discussion of migration. And I was struck by you know, Shanta's example of migrants all being from Africa. I know it's because he's worked a lot on Africa. But, but in the media, you have exactly the same bias which is when we think migration, we think Africans, and this is actually quite, quite interesting. So if you look at the numbers uh, you know, in, in Europe particularly, in fact, um, you know, in, in, in Europe, despite all the, polit the political rhetoric about massive invasion of Africans, wave of African migrants, um, you know, a, a French president was actually uh, quoted as, as saying, you know, uh, be careful, uh, you know, Africans will flood the world soon. That was Jacques Chirac. So when you look at that, those political pronouncements and then look at the numbers, then you realize it's something, there's something quite odd. You know, out of the total refugee to Europe, only 2% are from Africa. 
compared to 65% from MENA, 14% from Europe and Central Asia, 9% from South Asia. So it's quite puzzling to me why when we speak of immigration in Europe, most of the focus is on African immigration and the numbers do not support that focus. Also, one myth is that you know, Africans are you know, fleeing the continent and going elsewhere, but that also is not supported by data. In fact, you know, uh, most of migration in Africa is intra-Africa. And you know, um, you know, countries like South Africa and Cote d'Ivoire now host more than three million migrants from Africa. So it's not always the case that, you know, um, you know, migration from Africa is actually going out. Um, you know, if you really think of the, the overall migration, um, about 2% of the to total population migrate out of Africa. The average is 3% for the rest of the world. So in fact, less Africans are actually migrating out of the continent than it is the case for the rest of the world. Now, these are numbers and numbers, and I think I thought it was quite important also to highlight that, you know, um, you know, those political pronouncements, as Shanta has mentioned, do not always match reality. They don't always match, match the numbers. Now, the one other important fact, however, is that the pace of migration in Africa has actually accelerated in the past 10 years. And what is interesting is it has accelerated at the time where economic growth was actually, you know, quite high. Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa was growing at above 4.5% per year. But that number has increased because of a number of factors, including, you know, you know openness to the world. And there is more and more, uh, you know, uh, opportunities for Africans, including through uh, internet, to have an idea of the standard of life that is actually globally acceptable. So less and less people would agree to live below a dollar per day and just be contented with that. So there is a pressure given the overall context. And I think it is important, therefore, that in addressing uh, the, uh, you know, in designing policies to, uh, to address the issue of migration, that we take into account that, you know, the source of migration matters. You know, what are the drivers of migration? In the past in Africa, most of the migration was driven by conflict. But a number of studies are now showing that that driver has shifted to economic reasons. And why do we, you know, you know, it may sound counterintuitive that why growth is actually high, that we have, you know, more migration, but the issue is here is inequality. While growth has been high in Africa over the past 10 years, uh, you know, that, has, that growth has actually been accompanied by increased inequality. Most of the growth was actually, uh, you know, happening uh, through uh, commodities and, and, and natural resources that have not created jobs. And this is certainly one important aspect of it because, you know, if you want to address the issue of immigration, we would have to deal with the issue of jobs for the youth in Africa. I'll come back to that very quickly. Yes. So, now, when it comes to economic impact of migration, the benefits Shanta has mentioned are absolutely obvious for Africa. You know, migrants, African migrants now contribute remittances that are higher than development assistance. If you take 2015, for example, African migrants remit more than $35 billion, which is more than all of, all of you know, international development assistance combined. So these migrants are certainly, you know, having a productivity higher wherever they go, 
which is allowing them to actually live at a level higher than where they were before and also helping countries, helping their own, their, their, their source countries. Now, an important question that has been discussed in terms of impact, economic impact of migration on the host countries has been this issue of brain drain. And there again, there is no evidence that Africans leaving the continent are actually penalizing their countries. We've looked at uh, the numbers and there is no clear relationship between migration, especially migration of high skilled workers and growth in countries in Africa. And to do, to, you know, there is actually evidence in other parts of the world that diaspora is actually contributing to higher growth in their host countries. And there are new products now, including the diaspora bonds that are being issued by countries. And diaspora is actually leading to an increase in investment in a number of African countries. So the economic case is, is clear, and I completely agree with Shanta. It's not an economic issue anymore. It is a completely irrational reaction to, uh, uh, to, to, to and it was quite, quite clear economic um, uh, a positive economic phenomenon. Now, what can we do and what are we doing in the Africa region? First, I think the focus should be on creating jobs for the African youth. Unfortunately, when you look at the international reaction, most of it is still treating migration as, you know, emanating from conflict. And there are a number of initiatives now that are actually militarizing the response to immigration. Italians have just sent troops in the Sahel. You know, the G5 is sending troops to the Sahel. But we need, obviously, to, you know, control civil unrest and, and, and terrorism, but we also need to be investing heavily on creating jobs for, for uh, the youth in Africa. And to that point, the overall agenda 2063 by the African Union on industrialization is important. We, we need to take a second look at trade agreements in Africa that are probably going against the move for industrialization, including in services. So I think that's, that's certainly important. Uh, we need to look at labor markets functioning. Since most of the migration in Africa is actually intra-Africa, we need to be looking at how our labor markets are functioning, how we are integrating uh, migrants' communities in our, in, our, in our work in Africa. The third important aspect is, um, you know, addressing the issues of inequality in, in Africa. And while, you know, a number of African countries have seen uh, a significant increase in their GDP per capita, you know, poverty has seldom declined at the same pace. And in a number of countries in Africa, we are now seeing a reversal of poverty declines that we had in the uh, early 2000s. So we need to not only, uh, you know, um, emphasize the um, projects to reduce poverty, but also tackle squarely inequality. And I think this is, uh, uh, this is uh, something we are certainly doing in Africa. The last point is on climate-related migration. When you disentangle the economic you know, uh, drivers of, of migration, most of it is actually climate-related. And I think it is important, and the Africa region is certainly in, you know, involved in working on a number of projects that are dealing with climate, uh, climate uh, resilience, in, in, in our countries. So to sum up, I'll just, uh, I want to say uh, three things. One, we need to set the record straight on African migration. The numbers do not match the worry. Second, you know, the drivers of migration in Africa have changed and the focus should be more on economics and less on military reactions. And the third thing is we need to address the issue of job, jobs for the youth in Africa and, 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 and tackle inequality. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Um, now we have time for a um, few questions and answers. And um, don't hesitate to ask big questions because the problem is big. And we have avoided the big picture uh, 
questions so far. Uh, I mean, the panelists have avoided the big picture questions so far. Um, Can so, you give us an example? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot, Sudhir. Um, uh, so questions, um, if you could please uh, use the microphone. And we'll take three questions and then have a round of uh, answers, and then we'll go to the next questions. And uh, if you want to just say what, your name, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Chelsky, GMFDR. Um, I, 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 I totally accept the notion that on net, immigration migration is a positive. Um, but I don't think we should move too quickly past the, well, how do you compensate the losers? Um, because unlike trade where you at least know the sector and perhaps therefore the region and you can identify the community when you're talking about migration how do you avoid a compensation where people are gaming the system how do you really actually identify who the losers are going to be um, i think the economics are a lot more complicated there um, but the one thing we shouldn't do is dismiss the economic argument because it does exist for communities within communities Good afternoon. Uh, wonderful to be here with uh, back in a, a nomad event. Christian Aigenzuki, uh, I'm the EFI program leader for Bangladesh, uh, Bhutan, and Nepal. And wonderful to see such a distinguished panel, all, all migrants, I might add, uh, on, on such a key topic. Uh, two questions. One is um, on Paul Collier's book. Uh, when he came out with this a few years back, if memory serves, he was putting forward a framework uh, suggesting that you know the, the, the national level polities they are the ones who decide, and um, you know that, that essentially migration you know the flow of migrants shouldn't move too fast to get ahead of I guess the absorptive capacity of the host community or the assimilation um, the ability willingness to assimilate of the incoming migrants. Otherwise, you end up uh, with difficulties. Now, when he came out with this book, uh, I think it was—I think it's fair to say that uh, it was met with a lot of hostility from the migration community. Uh, I wonder, given the I guess three, four, five years that have gone by since, uh, whether it's time to revisit that. And you know, was was he right? There's your a big question. Um, and then uh, just on the forced migration, uh, Hans-Peter, I think you know, it's a, a critical issue uh, coming from Bangladesh that is struggling with such a huge influx in a very quick, uh, very short amount of time. Um, you know, the, 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 the bank teams have been struggling to nudge the government to think about the issue or address the issue in a slightly more medium-term, long-term way. Uh, so... Be grateful for any suggestions on, on how we might do that, and clearly, you know, moving into the advocacy, po you know, politics uh, side of it does kind of take us outside of our uh, comfort zone. But any suggestions there would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, to the speakers for such a nice discussion. So my name is Rafi. I'm just an intern who asks a lot of questions. So. Um, um, so my question, I don't want to sound antagonistic here, but because I'm a student of economics myself, um, but during the um, time you guys were speaking, uh, the takeaway, one of the takeaways that I took was that how there is a seemingly disconnect between uh, the impact of uh, migration and uh, the populist rhetoric in most and of the, the host countries. Given that the case, uh, don't you think that there is a need so from an economic perspective, there is a clear disconnect to bring a, a more interdisciplinary approach, especially given the dirt of uh, non-economists present at the World Bank. And that is something I discussed with one of the former chiefs of the chief economists of the World Bank, too, and he essentially agreed with me, so just as a postscript. So there is, is there a need, do you guys think, to bring more uh, disciplines into the fold of the discussion when we are looking at migration disciplines such as anthropology, sociology, and have a more interdisciplinary approach uh, towards solving the issue of migration. So that's one of my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how how would you? I mean, we don't have to go alphabetically now, but um, you want to? Left to right. 
<laughs> Thanks. I thought that these were really all very good questions. And I'm also going to uh, use this uh, opportunity to ask questions of my own. Um, one thing here is uh, this, this issue that uh, Rafi just raised, which is the, about the disconnect. And there, I, I'm not sure I agree with uh, Shanta, with your uh, view that this, we could put the trade lens on this, that there are affected uh, com losing communities and, and winners, and then we compensate the losers. I agree with those who've said, A, that it's very, Chuck, that it's very hard to identify uh, the losers. But in addition, uh, I don't think the, the, ones, the, the greatest opposition is where we should, uh, we should see uh, most of the losers. So I lived, in, I lived through the referendum in, in the UK, the, the Brexit referendum. There was a lot of analysis afterwards, you know, who voted why, why and what. And, um, and one thing that was very, very strong was that uh, there was a negative correlation between counties that had large uh, immigrant populations and, um, and the, uh, the, the Brexit vote. Um, so the, the, more, the higher the immigrant share, the lower the Brexit, the, the, the leave vote. Uh, and that tells you something. You have a similar phenomenon here in the U.S. When you look at uh, sort of the, uh, uh, I don't know, the Midwest, uh, the Bible Belt, those are not the communities. Now in Alabama, when we were sort of following what was going on there, those were not the communities that had the largest shares of, of Hispanic or other uh, inflows. Yeah? Um, in fact, it's the coasts that have the, the largest uh, shares, and it's some of the large cities, and those do not tend to go uh, uh, heavily anti-immigrant. So there is actually uh, something else going on, in my view. Uh, and because of what Shanta and, and others have said, there isn't uh, really an identifiable economic uh, uh, significant downside in the aggregate. Um, there also isn't necessarily a significant economic downside in, in, the, in, in sort of smaller uh, uh, geographies. Uh, and uh, what we're looking at is, is more a phenomenon where communications play a very big role, uh, fake news has played a big role. This has been true for immigrants and, and other populations you know, for a very long time in history. Uh, what the pogroms against the Jews in, in medieval Europe you know, they usually started as a result of fake news. And we have similar phenomena here with, uh, with, uh, with completely distorted views of uh, uh, crime and, uh, and, and similar phenomena uh, being associated with immigration, which we know aren't true. So there's, there's something else going on here. There's, there's an, an issue of uh, identity uh, and uh, communications and the way that, uh, that one's interests uh, are sort of distorted by various lenses that are being applied. How do we address that? It's, it's probably not for economists alone. I completely agree with you, uh, Rafi, on this one. Um, on this question of uh, the Paul Collier question, um, and I think much as he, uh, he was being attacked, I think he was being attacked also for certain statements in, in, this, uh, in, in his work. The general idea that one, one has to take account of a community's absorption capacity, I don't think it's, you, you cannot disagree with that. Uh, the point is how can we strengthen community's absorption capacity? Uh, and Germany is actually a pretty interesting um, case study there uh, right now because when, when the numbers came in in 2015 and um, uh, and so it's a sense of oh, a million refugees, how is this going to work? Uh, there, was, there were a lot of stories initially about things going wrong, but that has really gotten lost. I don't know who's, who's, who's read something uh, in recent months about difficulties uh, with absorbing the, uh, the refugee, the 2015 refugee population in Germany. There are not many stories because in principle it's going well. Uh, countries have... Uh, probably more capacity than we believe in absorbing uh, uh, these these kinds of influxes, and that is where we, uh, I think, as an MDB, have to focus on how to strengthen that uh, that kind of absorption capacity and and ensure uh, that uh, we, we minimize frictions in the in the refugee communities. And Bangladesh, uh, this is a, a very good point. We should uh, have a conversation. Uh, I'm not sure that IFC is so far looking at how to bring the private sector into the 
the, the displaced persons in, in Bangladesh. Uh, is it already the right time? Is this something uh, at this stage to focus on? Is this something for the second stage? I'd, uh, I'd enjoy a conversation bilaterally. So let, let me just pick up on a couple of points, I mean, in response to the question, a couple of points that Hans-Peter made as well. Uh, first, I mean, I, I take your point, Hans-Peter, that the analogy with trade is not perfect, obviously, right? There are people, not goods. So you can't put tariffs on them, you can't remove tariffs on them. But having said that, I think it is really important that the bank and an institution like the bank play the role of exposing the truth, of exposing the real numbers. Take a simple example, right? The Malaysians were convinced that Indonesians were coming in and worsening the lives of unskilled Malays. Well, guess what? Our work actually showed that that wasn't the case. It's important to get that out there. It's important to show that that, that, that what the reality is. Now, having said that, yes, these are sovereign countries making decisions as to who to let in and who not to let in. So we as the World Bank can't be telling them, you've got to take in X number of Filipinos or Y number of Vietnamese. What we can tell them is these are the trade-offs. And this, and this is the way in which your current migration policies might actually be not just third best, but a hundredth best. It may be terrible in terms of making things worse for everyone. And that, I think, is the, is the role we should play. And this brings me to Rafi's point. Rafi, that is a straw man, okay? The World Bank is not dominated by economists. Let's, you know, put that aside. I mean, if that were true, Shanta would be president of the World Bank, and he's not, and he ain't going to become president of the World Bank. So let's put that aside. And let's also make the point that, you know, at the very beginning, Dilip said, nomad is interdisciplinary. I, I take his word for that. It is interdisciplinary. It's not, this isn't something, it's not just Dilip and his economist friends who are looking at, at migration. They, they're bringing in the perspectives of sociologists, of anthropologists, of political scientists, because as we all agreed, this is an issue on which economics alone, so, so just, just because here we are talking about the potential economic benefits of migration doesn't mean that we are all convinced. We've all been doing this long enough to know that just telling someone that it's X percent of GDP ain't going to win the political argument, it ain't going to win the policy debate. We've got, and, 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 and sure, there are, there are social costs to migration. Uh, we, we know those well from a lot of the literature on this issue. Those have to be brought into, uh, in, into the fold. Um, Finally, on, on Paul's book, uh, Christian, you know, I, I think it goes back to this thing of uh, the way that migration policies are often designed. I mean, Shanta mentioned this at the, at the very outset, right? The, the, the inequity of discriminating uh, against people on the basis from, of where they are. Now, if you look at, for instance, Australia's policy with regard to temporary workers. They have, a, they have a not so subtle distinction between people like you who might come as backpackers, I mean maybe not, not you now but you 20 years ago, uh, <laughs> versus someone from the Pacific Islands. And it is very overtly discriminatory against the latter. While at the same time Australian policy is supposedly to you know, benefit to, to give large amounts of overseas development assistance uh, to benefit the Pacific Islands. I think it's our role to put that on the table and tell the Australians that, guys, this has nothing to do, you know, yes, you should have the discussion as to whether you have the, the ability to absorb, uh, you know, a hundred more people from Vanuatu uh, as seasonal workers as opposed to someone from uh, Germany. But, uh, but, but I think uh, taking that at face value, I think, is a little bit uh, too easy. Thanks. Um, yeah, let me go along the same lines, and I'm going to push back at both Rafi and Hans-Peter uh, on this. Because, you know, we, we have to just keep in mind that there is, there is an economic explanation for some of the, the resentment, and I'll get to the political one in a minute. But the, the real question is, as long as that's part of the problem, can we also come up with an economic solution? 
And that's the, that's the, the question. Right? If, if we understand it, then we can. And that gets to what uh, Jeff Chelsky was asking, which is this compensation mechanism. This is no really, at, at some level, no different from compensation mechanism for trade adjustment. The, the key is, do we have policies in place where when people within the country are moving because of a labor shock of some kind, that there are ways to, to smooth that shock? And you know, we used to historically think of those when there's a trade, when there's trade liberalization or import competition and so on, but it could also be thought of in terms of when there is migration, when there is an influx of, of migrants that is going to have some displacement effects on the people in the area where they, where they come in, maybe just certain skill groups, other skill groups will actually relish it, and then uh, can we, can we uh, compensate them? Now, the, the point that Hans Peter made, which is correct, which is that you observe this, this seeming paradox that people who actually live among migrants are the ones supportive of migration, and the ones who have never seen a migrant in their lives are the ones who vote against it. Uh, I mean, the classic case was Switzerland, I think, when they had that referendum, and Zurich and Geneva, the two cantons which have most of the migrants, are the ones that voted to, to keep migration. And, you know, Grisson and all these, you know, in the center, which had never seen a migrant in their lives, um, uh, voted against it. But I think there, it, it really, I can explain some of it, not all of it, from the same perspective, because the, the same argument that we said when migrants come, they're concentrated, there are, that's huge numbers in a, in a specific location, that has a cost in terms of displacement, but it also has agglomeration externalities. It also has a benefit. You get, the, you get a, a, a rich number, a rich variety of, of migrants uh, who can then actually help give that industry a, a, a boost. And the people who live there are the ones who recognize that. So you do get the Londoners, and you were one of them, <laughs> who actually appreciate having, having migrants because you have you know, good French chefs and good French restaurants and Indian chefs and, and, and so on in, in, in London which you wouldn't get in some remote area in, in England where there are no uh, migrants. So there is a way. Now, that said, I fully accept that there are some limitations to this kind of analysis, and there are other things going on, like identity that, uh, that Hans Peter was talking about. But, you know, I don't think Paul Collier's book actually resolved that. Uh, he, he speculated. I mean, the, the, the trouble with Paul's book, which is, uh, you know, in contrast to all of his other work, is incredibly devoid of empirical evidence. It was a speculation that if you have more migrants in an area, then the, the indigenous population will, uh, will uh, vote less for, for public goods, for local public goods. And so you'll find that the quality of public goods would go down. Now, that's a conjecture. But there was no empirical evidence that, he, that, that, uh, that that was the case. And indeed, you know, when people have tried to look at it, the evidence is mixed. You can go, uh, you can go either way. And as uh, I think Hans uh, ref alluded to, there are some pretty, pretty striking uh, errors in that book uh, as, as well, which makes you question the, the other things, you know, because there was a statement about the, uh, the, the, uh, the number of indigenous Britons in London uh, was, they were a minority, and it turns out it's 62 percent. Uh, uh, so uh, that, that's, uh, <laughs> it's either just completely wrong or it's a kind of mildly racist statement because it was, uh, <laughs> it didn't include the, <laughs> the uh, indigenous Britons who, who look like uh, Sudhir and Dilip and me. <laughs> You know, I, I, Paul Collier, uh, I remember two statements from his book. One, one sentence was, uh, unabsorbed diaspora is like unabsorbed carbon dioxide in the air. That was one that has stuck with me. The other one was, we don't want Tonga to empty out of its people just as we care for, I'm not reading verbatim, I'm just speaking what he said, something similar. Uh, just as we care for the pandas in Chengdu, even though we don't see them, we also don't want Tonga, Tonga to empty out. We want Tongans to be there. So these are two statements that kind of corroborates what uh, Shanta said. It was a lot of speculation coming from a migrant who started by talking about himself uh, as a migrant, his grandfather as a migrant, ending 
with himself as a migrant and saying all his family are all over the world, uh, it was a strange thing. I guess it comes with age or something like that. Uh, so, uh, Albert, <laughs> didn't mean to make you the last one again, but just... That's how it is. Um, you know, I, I, you know I, I, would, I would want to basically say, you know, um, that, that view of, of Paul uh, is, is certainly not in line with the number of things he has actually written himself. And, and this is not one of his best books from my perspective, and I generally don't like to comment about that one even when I talk to him, because it didn't look really or sound like what he's been writing in many other things. Um, but the but, but most important point I really want to highlight is that we need to address the issue of migration on host communities. And we need to address that through economic tools but also try to understand what are the other, you know, aspects of, of uh, you know, of, 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 you know, what are the other drivers of your behavior. And I think, I think agreeing with, uh, you know, uh, uh, agreeing with Ravi that it's, it certainly it needs a, uh, you know, a pluridisciplinary, uh, disciplinary, uh, uh, you know, uh, view and that's actually what we're trying to do in the Africa region. When uh, we're approaching the issue of the refugees in Kenya, for example, refugee communities and their integration to the uh, local labor market, it's not a team of economists. Actually, the work is led by our social, uh, social scientists, and, and we definitely want the economists to, you know, to work with them, but it's not just a, uh, a pure economics analysis. And um, on, on the on the economic approach, I think it's important to really uh, look at the functioning of labor markets and, and really bust those myths. There are just so many myths about wage that are across the world. It's not just in, uh, you know, in, in the U.S. Or, or in Europe. Even in Kenya, the notion that you know, allowing the, refugee, the Somali refugees to, to work would actually depress the wage, it's, it's, it's present. So we need to provide a kind of empirical evidence that would allow us to bust those, those myths. Um, uh, the second thing that we can probably do is, is leveraging technology. I haven't heard that word here in this panel, but, but it's actually one of the ways through which probably Hans Peter and his team and others I've seen and colleagues can actually help us using I, you know, IT to come up with more innovative solutions. One example is, is the uh, African Union passport, which has been lingering. And from all, you know, uh, you know from, from, from all viewpoints on the continent, implementing this project would actually allow uh, more free, uh, free circulation of, of, of people and, you know, remove that discrimination based on the place of birth. And, and again, given the fact that most of our migration is within African continent, this could actually lead to a better, uh, you know, uh, a, a better welfare for, for, for migrants within the continent. And the, the, the last thing I, I wanted to, uh, to say is, you know, trade agreements have been part of the issue on the continent of Africa, where, you know, most of the you know, most of the labor-intensive industries have actually disappeared over time. Yet, we are all arguing for structural transformation. We are all arguing for industrialization. Yet, trade agreements are actually, you know, calcifying the structures of these economies into, you know, extractive sectors that are low job creators. So we'll have to really take a second look at trade when it comes to Africa, especially in uh, relation to, to job creation for the youth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there any pressing question from the audience, anyone? It's brief and, okay, we have two now, but it has to be punchy, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have to go in. So I'm Caitlin Gallagher from Bank Information Center. Um, I'm wondering about some ways that the World Bank is trying to shift borrowing government's views on migration um, through mechanisms like the Global Concessional Financing Facility and what sort of traction that has gotten um, in shifting policy towards these recommendations that you're giving. 
And given the World Bank's mandate for citizen engagement, and I'll shift the terminology a little bit given the topic to stakeholder engagement, um, how are migrants themselves being brought into those conversations? Brief. A quick uh, sort of big picture question. Is the nation state now a problem? And is this a situation where the centralized nation state is having a problem with cities, which we see here, uh, for example, of uh, the sanctuary cities? And uh, is there a problem with, uh, that is London versus the UK, uh, San Francisco versus uh, the US? That's it. Anyone wants to take uh, the questions quickly? Short. Oh, yeah, I'll take, uh, uh, um, I mean, the, the, the first question, if I understood, there were sort of several questions in there, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take the ones I can answer. I mean, I think the 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 recognition, the, what has happened, say, in Lebanon and Jordan with the movement to uh, give work permits to refugees and set up special enterprise zones and so on, has actually brought to the fore what Sudhir was talking about, which is there are existing distortions in these countries and those dis which were there before the refugees ever came in. And all the, what the refugees are doing is amplifying them. And so the, the response by having more flexible labor markets, having more flexible uh, foreign investment regimes, which is what uh, the Jordanians are doing, is actually a, an attempt to try to make the, make the economy function better, not just for the refugees, but for the, uh, for the uh, resident Jordanians. Uh, and the hope is that that actually will will uh, expand the, uh, the 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 benefits uh, to uh, of, of of that. Um, just one point about Supriya's question about nation states. You know, it is true. I mean, it, you know, we, for instance, when we worked on refugees in uh, no and and migrants in Europe, while official government, central governments, didn't want to discuss the matter, shall we say, um, the mayors of the cities would, uh, would come rushing uh, for, for help, partly because they're the ones who have to deal with the, uh, the issue, but secondly, they're also the ones who saw the benefits. So you actually can, can see, I don't, I don't necessarily think that the nation state is about to, to uh, dissipate, but I think we as, as analysts and, uh, people, and, and to some extent advocates could actually benefit from working at the at the subnational level. So, so just on on uh, engaging uh, with countries, uh, you know. So, I mean, I, I think this is an issue where we have to, and and I think this is one of the challenges for the bank is we've become so country focused now in our in our approach which I think works for many issues, but I think quintessentially migration involves multiple countries. So you've got to find a way, I think, of uh, we have, have to find a way of engaging both at the country level, but also at, uh, in, in kind of national, uh, in uh, uh, groupings of countries. And so, for instance, in the Asian, in, in, in the context of East Asia and Pacific, we do this both with regard to ASEAN, with, uh, uh, by engaging with ASEAN. Because ASEAN, at the end of the day, will, will come up with rules that govern migration within ASEAN across these countries. Now, there will be bilateral deals, but there'll also be that multilateral setting. And so that's a very powerful way, I think, for us to, to convey some of these messages, to find uh, uh, ways of engaging. Uh, similarly with the Pacific Islands, I mean, there, is, there are... Uh, they operate together in several fora, including with Australia, including with, in this case, with the receiving countries, Australia and New Zealand. And so that's a very good uh, 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 locus for our, uh, uh, for our efforts and for, to bring some of this uh, to the table and to have discussions with them. Thank you, Sudhir. I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, the board paper, which is linked from the, uh, the BDL announcement, uh, the board paper was Migration and Development, a Role for the World Bank Group. It was released in uh, September 2016, about a year ago. Uh, identifies four areas of action for the World Bank Group. Financing programs, addressing fundamental drivers of migration, 
um, harnessing the benefits of migration in line with the sustainable development goals. That includes reducing remittance costs and reducing recruitment costs. And the fourth one is improving data and knowledge related to that improving public perceptions by providing analytics and facts. And um, in, the, in terms of the SDGs, there is a database on reducing remittance costs that the World Bank is the custodian for that. Also, the World Bank is custodian for reducing uh, recruitment costs data. Together with ILO, NOMAD and ILO today released uh, survey data. It is publicly posted now on uh, recruitment costs for several corridors. So they are publicly available. Uh, they were released today to mark the International Migrants Day. And we are also, NOMAD is also doing a report together with uh, DEC Indicators Group. It's called the Migration and the Law Report. And uh, there have been, uh, we have collected data on 150 odd countries on how national law in different countries treat migrants and separately treat refugees. Uh, some striking facts are coming out from that. So watch out for that. That would be in uh, April. So I thought we had a great session, and um, I really want to thank the panelists for a wonderful session. Um, happy, happy holidays to all of you. Thank you. Happy migration.